Hello everyone. I am Ganesh Varnekar. I am one of the Prometheus team member and I am also a maintainer of Prometheus TSTB. And I am Dieter Plating. Uh, I've been working on monitoring systems for about 10 years, but I've never actually contributed to Prometheus before. So this is kind of my first time working with TSDB and I'm really enjoying it so far. And I really enjoy histograms. So when I had the chance to work on this project, I, I was very excited. So our colleague Bjorn Rabenstein already gave many presentations about histograms and how they're currently implemented in Prometheus, uh, what some of the shortcomings are and his ideas for better histograms. Um, but first, we should probably just do a quick recap. What is a histogram anyway? So basically a histogram is a way to categorize your numeric observations into ranges. And this is very useful uh, for looking at distributions of data, for example, for latency metrics. So in this example here on the left, you can see that um, there were three observations that were smaller or equal to 0 0.25. Then there were six observations between 0 0.25 and, and a half and so forth. So this is a really useful way to get uh, a good understanding of your distribution of data. It lets you calculate uh, percentiles and so forth. Um, the way this is currently implemented in Prometheus is you have a separate series for every single bucket. So you can see here, you have your different buckets. They all have a label declaring uh, one of the bounds. And of course they have the number of metrics in each. And then you also have some additional series, for example, a sum series uh, with the sum of all the samples and the count, which counts all the samples. So there are some shortcomings here that we intend to improve on. Uh, but first of all, of course, whatever currently works should keep working. That's kind of obvious. Um, the second one, this is kind of a uh, one of the bigger problems, I would say, with the current implementation of histograms is that you have to uh, manually define your buckets and you basically have to make a guess around what the values will look like and then hopefully you know, your data won't go out of bounds or you or lose precision. And it's kind of a, a clunky method. Um, so in the new version, we would rather just do away with that completely and just automatically uh, come up with all the right bucket sizes. Third, we want to have uh, correct aggregation, both across time and also across labels. And especially when you have histograms with different bucket layouts, those different layouts should be chosen so that they are compatible and mergeable, basically, so that you don't lose, uh, that you can correctly aggregate them and, and don't lose any uh, data quality. And then, of course, uh, you need to be able to have very accurate estimations. You need to have a low error rate and you, so that you can compute correct quantiles and percentage estimations. And finally, we believe that if we can lower the cost of the histograms, um, then we can make partitioning much more feasible. Because I, I suspect that right now many uh, histogram users don't partition as much as they can. Like for example, partitioning by an HTTP status code label or by a route or a path label is currently not, not so common. But if we, if we make histograms much cheaper, then you can partition as much as you want. There is a big design doc that Bjorn wrote. Uh, it goes in the design um, very in depth and it's a very interesting read. So if you want to understand it more, you, you should look at the doc because currently in this presentation, we can only really cover a small bit of the design. So we recently had a hackathon at Grafana Labs. So Bjorn, Dieter and I thought it would be cool to get this design doc into a working prototype. And before we jump into the prototype, let's see why high resolution histograms are so useful. By the way, the heat map that you're seeing right now is reading the data from our prototype itself. So let's see what we can uh, figure out from this heat map. Initially, the request uh, have some kind of short band of latencies. And then after some time, the latency stabilizes. And you can see there are way a lot of requests for some buckets which show up as red. And after some time, a new canary was tested. 
and you can see the latency dropped and uh, but it became less predictable predictable because it was spread around a big time and you can clearly see when this new canary was deployed into the prod and all the latencies just dropped and spread across a big range and after some time uh, a part of the system started behaving weirdly and the latency shot up you can see two bands of slowness there it could be some heavy operation or some cold cache and you can see exactly the time when the issue started and the issues when the issue stopped and after the issue had stopped uh, the latency just kept on increasing and increasing until it became stable and within a band so this is the kind of uh, uh, visualization that we would like to get from high resolution histograms which not uh, feasible right now because of expensive buckets but in this prototype like in this talk we are going to talk about three things one is how do we expose this uh, high resolution histograms and how do we scrape it and then how can we encode these histograms efficiently into a tsdb and we benchmark the space uh, taken by these new histograms in the tsdb so as far as the instrumentation goes um this is based on you know the the current implementation and in fact if you look at the orange line here what this does is so this exposes the conventional histograms using using the current method um, but it gets a little bit more interesting when we look at these three items here so the sparse buckets factor that basically defines the precision of your histogram and this is a growth factor and it describes whenever you go from one bucket to the next bucket it describes how much growth you see so that as you keep adding adding more buckets they also keep growing and growing um, and because we automatically allocate buckets, uh, however many are needed to accommodate your data, you probably want to set some kind of limit because otherwise in theory, it can just grow infinitely. Um, in this case, we set a maximum number of 150. And the way we implement that limit, it's, it's in two ways. So the first way is we can reset a bucket and this declares that we could reset up to once per hour. And basically what a reset means is you start a new chunk and you get rid of all the buckets that were at some point used by some data and you only start using the buckets that are needed for the current data and hopefully and commonly that will be enough to get you under that limit um, if that's not sufficient to reach your defined limit then we have an, a second solution which is it start decreasing the precision so that's something to keep in mind that in certain cases when you hit your limit you might need to or it will automatically start uh, growing your buckets and your precision will go down a little bit so the encoding um, of how all the data after it gets scraped actually gets saved into histogram chunks there's so by the way this is a little bit simplified i, I left out a bunch of uh, other details but basically there's two main things. In the beginning of the chunk, you have your metadata and it describes the exact shape of your histogram. And then after that are the individual histogram samples. So the metadata, there's two key um, entries here. One is the schema, and this is simply a number that describes the growth factor. So we saw a growth factor of 1.1 earlier that basically gets encoded as a simple integer. And then we declare which buckets are actually being used because in theory you could have an infinite number of buckets the way it works is and by the way some of these buckets might be used for data some of those buckets might need to be skipped because they don't have any data and the way we implement this is quite simply as a list that says you know basically for example skip 10 buckets that are not used then you have 20 buckets that are used then you have this many that are not used then you have that many that are used again and so forth so this basically describes the entire range of buckets that are used um, and this is also why we call them sparse histograms, because in this infinite space of buckets, if you only use a subset of them, this is a very efficient way to not have the overhead of all the buckets that are not used. And I also just want to point out that using just these two items in the metadata, you can get the exact description of how the histogram looks like. As far as the actual data goes, 
Um, this is inspired by by the current XOR encoding of simple time series. There's just uh, there's some more fields, and then of course the buckets. This is a, a variable length field. But basically, the first histogram sample that comes in, um, we're, we're just going to store all the fields raw as integers and as floats and as a sequence of integers. Then the second histogram, we show, we're storing deltas. And the third and the fourth and so forth histograms, we, we just store delta of delta everywhere. The one exception here is the sum field, so the sum of all the observations. Because that's a floating point number, we use the XOR encoding from the Gorilla paper, just like the uh, the standard XOR encoding of time series. And all of this data gets written into a bit stream, which of course gets serialized as a, as a chunk of bytes. And so yeah, this contains the full metadata describing the histogram format and then all the histogram samples. And talking about our test setup, we instrumented the Cortex gateway on our Grafana Cloud dev clusters with both conventional and high resolution histograms. Cortex gateway is the component which sits in front of our Cortex clusters and all the read and write traffic goes through it. And we set up two Prometheus, one of them scraping the conventional histograms and one of them only scraping the high resolution histograms. And we compared the storage at saturation, which means all the buckets that had to be filled were filled and there was less fastness. And this is how the data looked like. In the conventional histograms, we had 14 fixed buckets, which means uh, you have 14 uh, time series data, uh, time series in the TSV for each bucket. And you just saw that we have some additional series for each histogram. One of them being the infinite bucket. One of them is some uh, series. One of them is count series. So add those three up, then you have 17 TSDB series per histogram. And for sparse high resolution histograms, uh, the number of buckets varies. In our uh, uh, data, we saw that it varied between one bucket to 128 buckets, and it's dynamic. And because all of these buckets are stored in the same chunk, we only need one time series in the TSTB to represent a histogram and all its buckets. So we have two blocks, two data blocks under observation here. One of them uh, scraped data for 18 hours, which had 249 histograms. And you can see the number of series. It's a, multi it's a multiple of 17 for the conventional, multiple of one for this pass. Similarly, block B is, is spanning two hours and 144 histograms. Though both of them scrape the same thing, the block A has nearly the double number of histograms because there was a rollout. So a few labels change, so you get more histograms. In the next slide, we will see how these dynamic buckets look like. So all of these, are, this is a snapshot of few of the series from the blocks for the sparse histogram. You can see that the number of buckets vary in huge numbers. For example, if uh, for querying, the query can be expensive or cheap. So the latency of query can span a huge range. So you have you have to cover too many buckets. And if you take example like um, a gateway timeout, it's mostly set at a fixed time. So you are always going to observe a fixed uh, time for that uh, particular histogram. So it's always going to fall in a single bucket. So you won't really need more than one bucket for that histogram. So this shows that uh, partitioning histograms into multiple histograms with different labels is not going to be expensive because the buckets are dynamic here. Now let's look at our benchmark results. Yep, this, this is pretty interesting. It also blew our mind. So the first column, you see the reduction in index size. The reduction is like 94 and 93% for the block. And if you look at it carefully, it is a 17x reduction or little more than 17x reduction, which was the ratio between number of series required for conventional and sparse histogram. And it's little more than 17x because in the index you store the series information, but in the sparse histogram, you don't have to store the LE label. So there comes the additional little more than 17x reduction in the index. And if you look at the chunks, though, 
we have more buckets in this pass histogram you still get an efficient coding so there is like 43 percent and 48 percent reduction in the size taken by the chunks themselves and if you combine both the sizes like the both index and chunks overall reduction is like 48 to 60 percent it it can vary based on how long your data is and this also means the memory that the head block would take will be little less because uh, it will be it's using the same encoding as used in the block and the number of series is it takes a lot of space in the memory usually and that's going to reduce with a single series per histogram so there comes the overall savings in memory and a uh, space so um let's start to recap uh, our conclusion so far so th there's very little configuration as we saw in the instrumentation section you basically have to define a precision but even that we can just default to something sane like 1.1 and you probably want to specify a limit, but hopefully you will never reach it. Just like in our experiments, uh, as, as you saw, we reached up to 128 buckets. We never reached our, our 150 limit. Um, but if you don't specify those, then basically you have zero config and it should just work out of the box. And with that growth factor of 1.1, we also observe a significantly more uh, basically precise bucket boundaries. So we see a a uh, difference in precision of about an, an order of magnitude compared to the, the manual bucket assignment. And then I also want to point out that as your observations, you know, if they go well beyond the range that you originally thought your data might lie in, you still get to maintain that same precision. So in the conventional current uh, implementation of histograms, I, I hope you would have accounted for some of your data and, and configured your buckets properly, because if your data goes beyond that range, suddenly your uh, your relative error starts going up significantly but but not with the new um, histograms and they're fully mergeable and aggregatable we didn't really go too much in detail uh, for that but uh, you'll you'll just have to check the design doc if you want to understand more about how, how that works but it's basically it's about when you have different bucket layouts how they are compatible and you can merge them and we saw that there was nearly half of uh, half of reduction of the storage requirement and there was more than 90 percent of index reduction so far in our test and depending on how many buckets you have chosen for your existing conventional histogram we'll see similar reduction in the index and uh, the sparseness makes it very efficient to have partitioning in the histogram we saw the buckets varied from 1 to 128 so when you have more partitioning it doesn't mean there is a linear cost as we have for conventional histograms where the buckets are fixed and uh, and basically we have a sublinear growth because the buckets are dynamic there are two limitations that i think are worth pointing out um, the first one is obviously the limit that we already pointed out earlier um, you, you probably want to set some kind of limit to make sure you know, if your data is really um, very, if you have a lot of variab variability in your data that you control the amount of buckets that you use. And as I pointed out earlier, we can just try to cut a new chunk and usually that works, but in certain cases that might not be sufficient. And then the precision will automatically get lowered. We currently don't have a way to really expose that, um, but this is something to think about in the future to maybe make that a little bit more clear in the UI. And then finally, we currently don't have custom bucket boundaries. So if you want to answer questions such as, what's the percentage of uh, requests that were exactly 250 milliseconds or up to 250 milliseconds, and you want to set very specific human-friendly boundaries like that, that's currently not supported. But I think Bjorn has some ideas on, on how to make that work. And the work that we have done till now only contains scraping and ingesting into the TSTB and retrieving histograms at a TSTB layer, the raw histograms. And we have a lot of future work to be done. Uh, the main one being the PromQL support so that PromQL can natively work with these sparse histograms. And also we could create sparse histograms uh, in recording rules using this PromQL. 
the heat map that you saw we needed to do some hacks uh, to get it working but it did not use any native prompt kill support and the next one because we want to uh, uh, one of our goal was what is working right now should keep working so we need a compatibility layer to bridge the conventional and sparse histogram so that they can work together and we want to uh, play with more data and determine the query cost and because there is a big reduction in index we uh, we think that it will be a reduction in lookup cost for these histograms so that is just a hypothesis but we need to play with a lot more data and determine the query cost so that's it um if you're interested in the code, you can check the sparse histogram branches of the Prometheus project and the client Golang uh, repositories. So that's just all of our experimental code so far. Uh, I emphasize experimental. <laughs> um, and yeah, we would love to hear what you think. So both Ganesh's and my Twitter handles are listed here. So please, please let us know what you think. And I hope that everyone has a great rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.